Modern Chinese Stories and Novellas from 1919 to 1949, edited by Joseph S. M. Lau, C. T. Xia, and Leo Wu Fan Li. Xiao Xiao by Shen Song Wen, translated by Eugene O. Young. Just about every day around the twelfth month, the folks at home seem to be blowing the bamboo pipes for a wedding. Following the pipes, a gaily decked bridal palanquin appears, gliding forward on the shoulders of two bearers. The girl is shut up tight inside, and even though she's wearing a festive gown of green and reds, something she doesn't get to wear every day, she can't help sobbing to herself. For in her heart, a young woman knows that becoming a bride and leaving her mother is to begin in time someone else's mother, means having to face a host of new and unexpected problems. It's almost like entering a trance, to sleep in the same bed with someone you hardly know in order to carry on the ancestral line. Naturally, it is somewhat frightening to think of these things, so if one is inclined to cry in such circumstance as so many before have cried, is it any wonder? There are, of course, some who don't cry. Xiao Xiao did not cry when she got married. She had been orphaned and had been sent to an uncle on a farm to bring up. All day, carrying a long, wide-brained bamboo hat, she was looking for dog droppings by the side of the road in gullies. For her, marriage meant simply a transfer from one family to another. So when the day came, all she could do was laugh about it, with no sense of shame or fear. She was scarcely aware of what she was getting into. All she knew was that she was to become someone's new daughter-in-law. Xiao Xiao was eleven when she got married, and little husband was hardly two years old, almost ten years younger, and not long ago suckling at his mother's breast. When she entered the house, hold she called him Sony, according to the local custom. Her daily chore was to take Sony to play under the willow tree in front of the house or by the stream, when he was hungry to give him something to eat, when he fussed to soothe him, to pluck pumpkin blossoms and dog grass to crown little husband with, or to soothe him with kisses and sweet nothings. Sony, now there, hush, hush, there, there. And now, with that, she would kiss the grimy little face the boy would break out in smiles. In good spirits again, the child would act up once more, and with his tiny fingers, he would paw at Xiao Xiao's hair. The brown hair was untidy and unkempt most of the time. Sometimes he had pulled too hard on her braid. The knot of red wool would come loose, and she would have to cuff him a few times. Naturally, he bawled. Xiao Xiao, now on the verge of tears herself, would point to the boy's tear-drenched face and say, Now, now, you naughty thing, you'd better quit that. Though fair and foul, every day she carried her husband doing this and that around the house, wherever her services were needed. On the occasion, she would go downstream to wash out clothes, to rinse out diapers, but she found time to pick out colorful striped snails to amuse the boy as he sat nearby. When she went to sleep, she would dream dreams that a girl her age dreams. She dreamt that she found a cache of copper coins at the back gate or some other place, that she had good things to eat. She dreamt she was climbing a tree. She dreamt she was a fish floating freely in the water. She dreamt she was so light and lithe that she flew up clear to the stars where there was no one, but all she could see was a flash of white and of gold. And she cried aloud for her mother, whereupon she woke up her heart still thumping. The people next door would scold her. You silly thing, what were you thinking of? Those who do nothing at all but play and wind up with bad dreams at the end of day. When she heard this, Xiao Xiao made no response, but merely giggled to herself, thinking of the good dreams that her husband's crying sometimes interrupted. He would sleep by his mother's side, so that it would be easier for her to breastfeed him, but there were times when he had too much milk or was colicky. Then he would wake up in the middle of the night crying, and Xiao Xiao would have to get up and take him to the bathroom. This happened often. Her husband cried so much, her mother-in-law didn't know what to do with him, so Xiao Xiao had to crawl out of bed, bleary-eyed and tiptoe in, brushing the cobwebs out of her sleepy eyes to take the boy in her arms and distract him with the lamp or the twinkling of the stars. If that didn't work, she'd peck and whistle, make faces for the child, blather on like a baby. Hey, hey, look at that cat. Until her husband broke out in a smile. They would play like this for a bit, then he would feel drowsy and close his eyes. 
When he was asleep, she'd put him back to bed, watching over him a while and hearing in the distance the insistent sound of a cock crawling. She couldn't help but knowing what time it was when she huddled back into her tiny bed. At day-night, though, she had had a sleepless night. She would flick her eyes open and shut to see the yellow and purple sunflowers outdoors shifting forms before her very eyes. It was a real treat. When Xiao Xiao was married off to become a little wife of a pint-sized little child, she wasn't any the worse to wear. One look at her figure was proof of that. She was like an unnoticed sapling in the corner of a garden, sprouting forth big leaves and branches after days of wind and rain. This little girl, as if unmindful of her tiny husband, grew bigger day by day. To speak of the summer nights is to dream. People seek the cool of the evening after summer heat. They sit in the middle of the courtyard, waving their rush fans, looking at the stars in the sky or the fireflies in the corners, listening to the weaver-made crickets on the roofs of the pumpkin sheds, clicking away intermittently on their looms. The sounds of the near and far intertwine like the sound of rain, and when the hay-scented wind falls full on the face, that is the time when people are of mind to tell jokes. Xiao Xiao grew very tall. She would often climb the sloping sides of the haystack, carrying in her arms her already sleeping husband, softly singing self-improvised folk melodies. The more she sang, the drowsier she felt, until she was too almost asleep. In the middle of the courtyard, her in-laws, the grandparents, and the two farmhands sat at random on wooden stools. By grandfather's side, there was a tobacco coil whose embers glowed in the dark. This coil, made of mugwort, had the effect of repelling long-legged mosquitoes. It was round around grandfather's feet like a black snake. From time to time, grandfather would pick it up and wave it about. Thinking about the day in the fields, grandfather said, Say, I heard that old chin said that the day before yesterday, there are a few co-eds passing through the town. Everyone roared with laughter. And what was behind that laughter? Everyone had the impression that co-eds didn't wear braids. Wearing the hair in the form of a sparrow's tear made them look like nuns, and yet somehow not like nuns. They wore their clothes in a manner of foreigners, yet they didn't look like foreigners. They ate, behaved in such a way, well, in a word, everything seemed out of place with them, and the slightest mention of coeds was cause enough for laughter. Xiao Xiao didn't understand much of what was going on, and so she didn't laugh at all. Grandfather spoke again. He said, Xiao Xiao, when you grow up, you'll be a coed too. At this, everyone laughed once more. Now, Xiao Xiao was not stupid when it came to people, and she figured this wasn't flattering to her, so she said, Grandpa, I won't become a coed. But you look like a coed. It won't do you if you don't become one. No, I certainly won't. The bystanders mind this for a laugh and egged her on. Xiao Xiao, what Grandpa says is right. It's not right if you don't become a coed. Xiao Xiao was flustered and didn't know what was going on. All right, if I have to, I have to. Actually, Xiao Xiao had no idea what was wrong with being a co-ed. The whole idea of co-eds would always be the thought of us queer in these parts. Every year, come June, when the start of the so-called summer vacation finally arrived, they would come in small groups from some outlandish metropolis, and looking for some remote retreat, they would pass through the village. In the eyes of the local people, it was almost as if these people would have dropped down from altogether a different world, dressed in the most bizarre ways, their behavior even more improbable. On the days these coeds passed through, the whole village would come up with joke after joke. Grandpa was an old-timer from the region, and because he was thinking about the carryings on of coeds he knew in the big city, he thought it would be funny to urge Xiao Xiao to become one. As soon as he made the crack, he couldn't help laughing, but he also had in mind the way Xiao Xiao felt, and so the joke wasn't totally innocuous. The coeds that grandfather knew were of a type. They wore clothes without regard to the weather. They ate whether they were hungry or full. They didn't go to sleep until late at night. During the day, they worked at nothing at all, but sang and played ball or read books from abroad. They knew how to spend money, 
With what they spent in a year, you could buy a 16 water buffalo. In the capital cities of the provinces, whenever they wanted to go anywhere, they dream of walking, but would climb instead into a big box where it took them everywhere. In the cities, there were all sorts of boxes, big and small, all motorized. At school, boys and girls go to class together. When they get acquainted, the girls sleep overnight with the boys. With no thought of a go-between or a matchmaker or even a dowry, this is what they called being free. They sometimes serve as district officials and bring families to their post. Their husbands are called masters still and their children little master. They don't need to tend cattle themselves, but they'll drink a cow's milk and a sheep's milk like little calves and little lambs. The milk they buy is canned. When they have nothing better to do, they go to a theater, which is built like a huge temple, and take from their pockets silver dollar. A dollar of their money can buy five setting hens hereabouts. With this, they purchase a piece of paper in the form of a ticket, which they take inside so they can sit down and watch foreigners performing shadow plays. When offended, they don't curse at you or cry. By the time they're 24, some still won't marry, while others are 30 and 40 and still have the cheek to contemplate marriage. They are not afraid of men, thinking men can't wrong them. If they do, they take the men to court and insist that the magistrate find them. Sometimes they spend the fine themselves, sometimes they share it with the magistrate. Of course, they don't wash clothes or cook meals. They certainly don't raise hogs or feed hens. When they have children, they hire a servant to look after them for only 5 or $10 a month so that they can spend all day going to the theater and playing cards or reading all those good-for-nothing books. In a word, everything about them is weird, totally different from the lives of the farmers, and some of their going-ons are not to be believed. When Xiao Xiao heard her grandfather saying all this, which explained everything, she felt a vague stirrings of unrest, imagining herself as a co-ed. Would she behave like the co-eds grandfather talked about? In any case, there was nothing frightful about these co-eds, and so these notions began to occupy this simple girl's thoughts for the first time. Because of the picture that grandfather had painted of the co-ed, Xiao Xiao giggled to herself for some time, but when she had collected herself, she said, Grandpa, when the coeds come tomorrow, please tell me. I want to look. Watch out, or they'll make you a maidservant out of you. I'm not afraid of them. Oh, but they read all those foreign books, recite scripture, and you're still not afraid of them? Can they recite the Bodsfana Kuan Yin Disciples Disaster Sutra? Or the Curse of the Monkey Sun? For all I care, I'm not afraid. They'll bite people, like officials. They only eat simple folk they munch even on the bones and don't spit up the remains are you sure you're not scared xiao xiao replied firmly no i'm not scared at the time xiao xiao was carrying her husband who apparently for no reason broke out of a sound sleep crying daughter-in-law used the tones of a mother and in half reinsurance half in remonstrance said sunny sunny you mustn't cry the voracious coeds are coming her husband continued to cry. He, there was no choice but to stand up and walk him about. Xiao Xiao carried him off, leaving grandfather who went on talking about other things. From that moment on, Xiao Xiao remembered what coed meant. When she dreamt, she would often dream about being a coed, about being one of them. It was as if she too had sat in one of those motorized boxes though she felt they didn't go much faster than she did. In her dream, the box seemed to resemble a granary, and there were ashtray mice with little red piggy eyes darting all over the place, sometimes squirming through the cracks, their slimy tails sticking out behind them. With this development, it was only natural that Grandfather would stop calling her Little Maidservant or Xiao Xiao and would call her Little Coed. When it caught her off guard, Xiao Xiao would turn around involuntarily. In the country, one day is like any other day in the world. They change only with the season. People waste each day as it comes, in the same way that Xiao Xiao and her kind hang on to each day. Each gets his spare, everything as it should be. A lot of city sophisticates while away their summers in soft milk, indulging in good food and drink, 
not to mention other pleasures. For Xiaoxiao and her family, however, summer means hard work, producing ten caddies or more of fine hemp and twenty or thirty wagons of melons. The little daughter-in-law Xiaoxiao on a summer day must tend to her husband as well as spin four caddies of hemp. By August, when the farmhands harvest melons, she would enjoy seeing piled high and rows on the ground of dust-covered pumpkin melons, each as big as a pot. The time had come to collect the harvest, and now the courtyard was filled with big red and brown leaves blown from the branches of the trees in the grove behind the house. Xiao Xiao stood by the melons, and she was working with a large leaf into a hat for her husband to play with. There was a farm hand called Montali Mutt, about 20 years old, who took Xiao Xiao's husband to a date tree for some dates. One whack with a bamboo stick and the ground would be covered in dates. Brother Montali Mutt, no more please, too much and you won't be able to eat them all. Despite this warning, he wouldn't budge. It was if, on account of the little husband's yen for dates, Montali Mutt wouldn't listen, so Xiao Xiao warned her little husband, Sonny, Sonny, come over here. Don't take any more. You'll get a bellyache from eating all that raw fruit. Her husband obeyed. Grabbing an arm full of dates, he came over to Xiao Xiao and offered her some. Sis, eat. Here's a big one. No, I won't eat. Come on, just one. She had her hands full. How could she stop to eat one? She was busily putting a hat together, and she wished she had some help. Sonny, why don't you put the date in my mouth? Her husband did as he was told, and when he did, he thought it was fun and came out with a laugh. He wanted him to drop the dates so that he could help her hold the hat together while she added a few more leaves. Her husband did as he was bidden, but he didn't sit still, all the while singing and humming. The child was always like a cat, prone to mischief when in a good mood. Sonny, what song are you singing there? Montale Mutt taught me this mountain song. Sing it properly so that I can follow. Husband held on to the brim of the hat and sang what he could remember of the song. Clouds rise in the skies, clouds become flowers. Among the corn stalks, plant beans for the roof. The beans will undermine the stalks of the corn, and the young maidens choke off flowering youth. Clouds rise in the skies, one after another, in the ground graves are dug, grave upon grave. Fair maids wash bowls, bowls after bowl, and in their beds serve knave after knave. The meaning of the song was lost on husband, and when he finished, he asked her if she liked it. Xiao Xiao that she did, asking where it came from, even though she knew that Montali Mutt had taught him the song, she still wanted him to tell her. Montali Mutt, he taught me. He knows a lot of songs, but I gotta grow up before he'll sing them. He realized that Montali Mutt could sing. Xiao Xiao said, Brother Montali Mutt, Brother Montali Mutt, why won't you sing a proper song for me? But that Montali Mutt, his face was coarse as his heart. He had a touch of vulgar about him. And knowing that Xiao Xiao wanted a song and sensing that she was about the age to understand, he sang for her the ballad of a ten-year-old bride married to some one-year-old groom. The story says that the wife is older she can stray a bit because the husband is still an infant but not yet weaned so leave him to suckle at his mother's breast of course little husband understood nothing at all of this song xiao xiao on the other hand had but an inkling when she had heard it xiao xiao put on airs as if to indicate she understood it all affecting outrage she said to montali mutt brother montali mutt you better stop that that song's not nice but Montali Mutt took an exception, but it is a nice song. Oh, no, it isn't. It isn't a nice song. Montali Mutt rarely said much. He had sung his song. If he offended anyone, he wouldn't sing again at all. He could see that she understood little of what she sang and was afraid that she would tell him on grandfather. Then he'd be really in for it, so he changed the subject to coeds. He asked Xiao Xiao if she had ever seen coeds exercising in public and singing western songs. If Montali hadn't brought this up, Xiao Xiao would have long forgotten all about coeds, but now he had mentioned it. She was curious to know if he had seen any lately. She was dying to see them. 
While he was moving the melons from the shed to the corner of the courtyard wall, Montley told her about stories of Coed singing foreign songs, all of which he had originally heard from Grandfather. To her face, he boasted of seeing four Coeds on the main road, each with a flag in her hands, marching down the road, perspiring and singing away just like soldiers on a parade. It goes without saying, this, this was all some nonsense he had cooked up, but the stories inflamed Xiao Xiao's imagination, all because Montley characterized them as instances of freedom. Montley was one of those clownish, leering, earthy types. When he heard Xiao Xiao say, with a measure of admiration, My brother Montley, but you have big arms, he would say, Oh, that's not all that's big. You've got such a big build. I'm big all over. Xiao Xiao didn't understand this. She just thought he was being silly, so she laughed. After Xiao Xiao had left, carrying her husband off, a fellow who picked melons with Montley, who had the nickname Mumbles, spoke out on this occasion. Montley, you're really awful. She's a 12-year-old virgin, and she's still got 12 years before her wedding. Without so much as a word, Monsley went up to the farmhand, slapped him, and then walked to the date tree to pick up the fruit that had dropped off. By the time of autumn melon's harvest, one could reckon a full year and a half that Xiao Xiao had been with her husband. The days passed, days of frost and snow, sunny days and rainy days, and everyone said how grown up Xiao Xiao was. Heaven kept watch over her. She drank cold water, ate coarse gruel, and was never sick the year round. She grew and blossomed. Although Grandma became something of a nemesis and had tried to keep her from growing up too fast, Xiao Xiao flourished in the clean country air, undaunted by any trial or ordeal. When Xiao Xiao was 14, she had the figure of an adult, but her heart was still as blithe and as unschooled as that of a child. When one is bigger, one gets heavier burden of household chores. Besides twisting hemp, spinning thread, washing, looking after her husband, she had odd jobs like getting feed for the pigs or working at the mill, flossing silk, and weaving. She was expected to learn everything. It was understood that anyone could make an extra effort would fit into the few chores to be done in their own quarters. The coarse hemp and spun silk that Xiao Xiao had gathered for two or three years were enough to keep her busy for three months in the crude shuttle of her room. Her husband had long ago been weaned. Mother-in-law had a new son, so her five-year-old, Xiao Xiao's husband, became Xiao Xiao's sole charge. Whatever happened, wherever she went, her husband followed her around. Husband was a little afraid of her in some ways, as if she were his mother, and so he behaved himself. In a way, they got along pretty well. Gradually, as the locality became more progressive, Grandfather would change his jokes to, Xiao Xiao, for the sake of freedom, you ought to cut off your braids. By this time, Xiao Xiao had heard this joke. One summer, she had seen her foes co-ed. Although she didn't take Grandfather's ribbing too seriously, she would nevertheless, whenever she would pass by a pond after he made his crack, absent-mindedly hold up her braid by tip to see how good she would look without a braid and how she would feel about it. To gather fed grass for the pigs, Xiao Xiao would take her husband up on the dark slope of Snail Mountain. The child did not know any better, so whenever he heard singing, he would break into song, and no sooner did he open his mouth than Montley would appear. Montley bent to harbor new thoughts about Xiao Xiao, which she gradually became aware of, and that made her nervous. But Monley was a man, with all the wiles and ways of a man, a strong build, nibble-footed, and who could divert and charm a girl. While he ingrated himself in Xiao Xiao's husband, he found ways of sidling up to Xiao Xiao and of disarming her suspicions about him. But what is a man compared to a mountain? With trees everywhere, Xiao Xiao would be hard to locate. So whenever he wanted to find Xiao Xiao, Montley would stand on a rise and sing in order to get a response from the little husband at Xiao Xiao's side. As soon as the little husband would sing, Montley, after running over hill and dale, would appear face to face before Xiao Xiao. When the child saw Montley, he felt nothing but delight. 
He wanted Monsley to make inset figures from grass or to carve out a flute for him from bamboo, but Monsley always came up with a way to send him off to find necessary materials so that he could sit by Xiao Xiao and sing for her those songs that would bring her guard down and produce a blush from her cheeks. At times, she was worried that something might happen, and she wouldn't let her husband go off at other times. It seemed better to send the boy husband off so that he wouldn't see what Montley was up to. Finally, one day, he let Montley sing his way into her heart, and he made a woman of her. At the time, little husband had to run down the mountain to pick berries, and Montley sang many songs, which he performed for Xiao Xiao. Pretty maid, an uphill path leads to your door. If others have walked a little, I've walked more. My well-made sandals are worn out, walked to shreds. If not for you, my pretty, then who for? When he had finished, he said to Xiao Xiao, I haven't slept a wink because of you. He swore up and down that he would tell no one. When she heard this, Xiao Xiao was bewildered. She couldn't help looking at his brawny arms, and she couldn't help hearing the last thing he said. Even when he went to the outhouse, he would sing for her. She was disconcerted, but if she asked him to swear before heaven, and even after he swore, which seemed good enough a guarantee, she abandoned herself to him. When little husband came back, his hand had been stung by a furry insect and was swelling up. He ran to Xiao Xiao. He pinched his hand, blew on the sting, and sucked on it to reduce the swelling. She remembered her thoughtless behavior a moment ago, and she was dimly aware that she had done something not quite right. When Montley took her, it was May. When the wheat was brown, by July, the plums had ripened, and how fond she was of plums. She felt a change in her body, so when she bumped into Montley on the mountain, she told him about her situation and asked what she should do. They talked and talked, but Montley had not had the faintest idea of what to do. Although he had sworn before the very heavens, he still had no idea. He was, after all, big in physique, but small in courage. Big physique gets you into trouble easily, but small courage puts you at a loss as to how to work your way out. After a while, Xiao Xiao would finger her snake-like black braid. Thinking of life in the city, she said, Brother Montley, why don't we go where we can be free in the city and find work there? What do you say? That won't do. There's nothing for us there. My stomach is getting bigger. That won't do either. Let's find some medicine. There's a doctor who sells stuff in the market. You better find something quick. I think it's no use running to freedom in the city. Only strangers there. There are even rules for begging your bread. You can't go about as you please. You're really worthless. You've been awful to me. Oh, I wish I was dead. I swore never to betray you. Who cares about betrayal? What I need is your help. Take this living thing out of my belly right away. I'm frightened. Montley said no more. After a while, he left. In time, little husband came by from a spot where he was gathering red fruit. When he saw Xiao Xiao sitting alone in the grass, her eyes red from crying, little husband began to wonder. After a while, he asked, Sister, what's the matter? It's nothing. I've got a cobweb in my eye. It smarts. Let me blow it away. No, don't bother. Hey, look what I've got. He took out of his pocket little shells and pebbles that he had snatched from a nearby brook. Xiao Xiao had looked at them, her eyes brimming, and managed to laugh. Sonny, we get along so well. Please don't tell anyone else I've been crying. They might get upset. And indeed, no one in the family got wind of it. Half a month went by, and Montley, taking all his belongings with him, left without such a word. Grandfather asked Mumbles, who roamed with Montley, whether he knew why Montley had left. He had merely drifted off into the hills, or had he enlisted in the army? Mumbles shook his head and said that Montley still owed him $200. He had gone with not so much as a note when he left. He was certainly a no good. Mumbles spoke his mind, but gave no indication where Montley m have gone. So the whole family buzzed about it all day, talking about this departure until nightfall. But after all, the farmhand had not stolen anything and had not esconded anything. So after a while, everyone forgot all about him. Xiao Xiao, however, was no better off. It would have been nice if she could have forgotten Montley, but her stomach kept getting bigger and bigger and something began to move inside. She felt a sense of panic. She spent one restless night after another. She became more and more irritable, 
with only her husband aware of that because she was now always harsher on him. Of course, her husband was at her side all the time. She wasn't even very sure what she was thinking herself. On occasion, she thought to herself, what if I were to die? Then everything would be all right. But then why should I have to die? She wanted to enjoy life, live on. Whenever anyone in the family mentioned, even in passing, her husband or babies or monthly, she felt as if a blow struck her hard on the chest. Around October, she was worried more and more people would know. One day, she took her husband to a temple, and making private vows, she swallowed a mouthful of incense ashes. But as she was swallowing, her husband saw her and asked what she was doing. She told him this was good for a bellyache. Of course, she had to lie, though she implored the Bahis Avas to help. The Bahis Avas did not see her way. The child grew and grew just as before. She went out of her way to drink cold water from the stream, and when her husband asked her about it, she said that she was merely thirsty. Everything she could think of tried, but nothing could divest her in the awful burden she carried within. Only her husband knew about her swelling stomach. He did not dare let on to his mother and father. Because of the disparity in their ages and their years mixed together, her husband regarded her with love mixed with fear, deeper even than his feeling of for his own parents. She remembered the oath that Montelie swore, as well as what happened besides. It's now autumn, and the caterpillars were changing into chrysalises of various kinds and colors all around the house. Her husband, as if deliberately taunting her, would bring up the incident when he had been stung by the furry insect and brought up unpleasant memories. Ever since that day, she hated caterpillars, and whenever she saw one, she had to step on it. One day, word spread that the coeds were back again. When Xiao Xiao heard this, her eyes stared out unseeing, as if in a daze, her daze fixed on the eastern horizon for some time. She thought, well, Montelie ran away, I can run away too. So she collected a few things, bent on joining the coeds on their way to the big city in search of freedom. But before she could make her move, she was discovered. To the people of the farm, this was a grave offense. So they tied her hands, put her away in the shed, and gave her nothing to eat for a whole day. When they looked into causes for her throttled attempt to escape, they realized that Xiao Xiao, who was in ten years to bear a son for her husband to continue the family now, now carried a child conceived by another. The produced scandal that shook the household and the peace and tranquility in the compound was totally disruptive. There were angry outbursts. There were tears. There were scoldings. Each one had his own complaint to make. Hanging, drowning, swallowing poison, all these long-suffering Xiao Xiao had considered disorderly, but in the end, she was too young and still wanted to hold on to life, so she did nothing. When Grandfather realized the way things were, he hit upon a shrewd plan. He had Xiao Xiao locked up in a room with two people to stand guard. He would call on her family and ask them whether they recommend she be drowned or that she be sold. It was no matter of saving face, they would recommend a drowning. If they couldn't bear to let her die, they would sell her. But Xiao Xiao had only the uncle, who worked on a nearby farm. When he was called, he thought at first he was being invited to a party. Only afterwards did he realize that the honor of the family was at stake, and this put the honest and well-intended fellow at a loss of what to do. With Xiao Xiao's belly as proof, there was nothing anyone could say. By rights, she should have been drowned, but only the heads of the family who read their Confucius would do such a stupid thing to save the family's honor. This uncle, however, hadn't read Confucius. He couldn't bear to sacrifice Xiao Xiao, so he chose the alternative of marrying her off to someone else. This also seemed a punishment, and a natural one at that. It was normal for the husband's family to be considered the injured party, and restitution was to be made from the proceeds of the second marriage. The uncle explained all this carefully to Xiao Xiao, and then was just about to go. Xiao Xiao clung to his robe and would not let him leave, sobbing quietly. The uncle just shook his head without saying a word, left. At the time, there was no reputable family wanted Xiao Xiao. If she was to be sent away, someone would have claimed to her, and for the moment she continued to stay at the home of her husband. Once this matter had been settled, no one, as a rule, made any more fuss about it. 
There was nothing to do but wait, and everyone was totally at ease on the matter. At first, Little Husband was not allowed in Xiao Xiao's company, but after a while, they saw each other as before, laughing and playing like brother and sister. Little Husband realized the situation about Xiao Xiao being pregnant. He understood that in her condition, Xiao Xiao should be married off to someone living far away, but he didn't want Xiao Xiao to be sent away, and Xiao Xiao for her part didn't want to go either. Everyone was in the quandary as what to do, though a force of custom and circumstance dictated what had to be done, there were no two ways about it. Lately, if one asked who was making up the rules and customs, whether the patriarch or the matriarch, no one could rightly say. They waited for a prospective husband. November came with still no one in sight. It was decided that Xiao Xiao might as well stay on for the new year. In the second month of the new year, she came to term and gave birth to a son, big-eyed with a large round head, a sturdy build, and with a lusty voice. Everyone took care of both mother and son. The customary steamed chicken and rice wine were served to the new mother to build up her strength, and the virtual paper money was burned to propagate the gods. Everyone took to the baby boy. Now that it turned out that the child was a boy, Xiao Xiao didn't have to be married off after all. When years later, the wedding ceremony for Xiao Xiao and her husband took place, her son was already 10 years old. He could do half a man's work, he could look after the cows and cut the grass, a regular farmhand who could help with the chores. He took a calling to Xiao Xiao's husband, uncle. Uncle would answer, with never a crossword. The son was called Herd Boy. At the age of 11, he was betrothed to a girl six years older. Since she was already of age, she could lend a helping hand and be very useful to the family. When the time for the bamboo wedding pipes to be sounded and the front door came, the bride inside in the sedan chair sobbed pitifully. The grandfather and the great-grandfather were both beside themselves. On this day, Xiao Xiao had lately given birth. The child was already three months old, and when she carried her newborn babe, watching the commotion and the festivities by the fence under the elm, she was taken back ten years when she was carrying her husband. Now her own baby was fussing, so she sang in low tones, trying to soothe him. Now there, there, look, a pretty wedding sedan is coming this way. Look at the bride's lovely gown. Look how beautiful she looks. Hush, hush, don't act up now. Behave yourself or mommy will get angry. Look, look, the co are here too. One day when you grow up, we'll get you a co-ed for a wife.